Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're jumping into Tempest AI's Q3 2025 results. And it's a, it's a bit of a puzzle. It really is. They had a fantastic quarter, beat expectations on revenue, on earnings. Hit that big profitability milestone everyone was watching. Exactly. But then the stock dropped almost 5% after hours. Yeah, 4.76% down. And that disconnect, that's what we need to unpack, right? Definitely. When the market shrugs off good news, it tells you it's all about the future story. Uh. So our mission here is to look at that forward guidance, the big growth plans, the AI ambitions, and figure out what it signals for the long term. Okay, let's start with the good news first, the Q3 numbers, because they were good. Very strong. Revenue hit $334.2 million. That's above the $328.7 million forecast. Not a huge beat, about 1.7% surprise, but still solid. And year over year, that growth is uh, pretty wild, 84.7%. It really shows the momentum they've had. And the earnings per share story was even better. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, the loss was only 11 cents per share, minus so 11 cents. Analysts expected, minus so alarm is 18 cents. So like a nearly 40% beat on the bottom line, that's significant. Hugely significant. But the headline grabber, the one mm. they've been working towards for years. Was getting to positive adjusted EBITDA first time ever. That's the one. They reported $1.5 million. Compare that to a year ago. A loss of what, over $20 million? Exactly. A $21.8 million loss in Q3 2024. So up over 100%. 106.8% uh, improvement there. Okay, so for you listening, let's clarify that. Why is adjusted EBITDA such a big deal for investors? Especially when, you know, the company technically still lost money overall. Right. The gap net loss was still $80 million. That's the official accounting number. Which includes things investors might want to see separately. Precisely. Adjusted EBITDA pulls out stuff like stock-based compensation that was $35 million and uh, one-time things like a $12 million loss on paying off some debt early. So that positive $1.5 million adjusted EBITDA, it basically says the core operations, the day-to-day -day running of labs, selling data, mm -hmm. that part is now generating cash before those other items. It suggests the underlying business model is starting to work financially. It validates the model, exactly. Shows leverage. But you still have to account for the gap loss, right? Stock comp is a real cost to shareholders down the line. Debt costs are real. Absolutely. Yeah. And that might be part of the market's hesitation. The fact the stock dropped to $85 despite hitting this goal. Yeah, it tells you the market's already looking past this win. You're thinking about future spending, the guidance, maybe general nervousness about tech stocks right now. Volatility in the sector is definitely a factor. For sure. Okay, so if the market is focused on what's next, let's pivot to that. The forward guidance. What did Tempest say? Well, they actually raised their full year revenue guidance for 2025. Oh, okay. To what? To about $1.265 billion. That keeps them on track for roughly 80% annual growth for the whole year. Still very aggressive growth. Extremely. And building on that Q3 adjusted EBITDA number. They expect to be positive for the full year now? Slightly positive, yes. Yeah. Which is uh, faster than maybe some expected. Yeah. And for Q4 specifically. What's the target there? They're forecasting around $20 million in positive adjusted EBITDA for the fourth quarter. Now, that $20 million number, I noticed it already includes the impact of a recent acquisition, right? Page.ai. That's right. They flagged that Page.ai, the digital pathology company they bought, will add about $5 million to quarterly losses, or expenses, rather. So they're absorbing new strategic costs, but still projecting strong sequential improvement in adjusted profit. It shows confidence in the core business's ability to offset those investments. Which brings us to the really long-term view. The CEO, Eric Lefkowski. He's not just talking next quarter or next year. No, he's talking about the next decade. The goal he laid out is sustained 25% unit and revenue growth, not just for a couple of years, but for 10 years. Wow. Okay, 25% growth for 10 years straight in diagnostics and AI. That sounds ambitious, maybe even daunting. It's a huge commitment. Doesn't that kind of target worry investors? Thinking about the sheer amount of capital needed, potential dilution, the risk of missing such a high bar. That's definitely the tension here. It's a bold claim. But the CEO's counterargument is about efficiency. He talked about maintaining that growth while actually slowing the rate of reinvestment. They did that this quarter. Right. He called that a sign of business model endurance. The subtext is their data asset lets them scale differently, more efficiently than just a traditional lab company. Okay, so they believe they can grow without spending proportionally more because of the data and AI side. That seems to be the bet. And they're also counting on continued momentum in the core genomics business. Like what? 
Things like MRD testing, minimal residual disease, reimbursement for that seems on track. That's a big growth area in oncology. Huge. And they also plan to submit their liquid biopsy test, XF, for regulatory review later this year. That could open up new markets and reimbursement. So let's break down those growth engines, genomics and data. How did they perform specifically in Q3? Both were strong. <laughs> genomics overall saw volumes up 33%. Okay. Within that. Oncology testing grew a solid 27%. But the real standout was hereditary testing. That's mostly Ambry Genetics, the company they acquired. How did Ambry do? Volume grew 37%. Really impressive acceleration. So much so that they raised Ambry's growth forecast for the year, right? Yeah, they bumped it up significantly. They now expect Ambry to grow in the low to mid 20s percent range for the year. Before, they were guiding mid to high teens. Is that just the market lifting all boats or are they taking share? They specifically said about half those gains were from taking market share. It wasn't just market growth. So what's driving that? Is it some new tech or more operational? It sounds largely operational, actually, getting their house in order. How so? The CEO mentioned improvements in Salesforce efficiency. Apparently, there were some uh, organizational changes or internal havoc, as he put it, in prior periods that they've now fixed. So basically, better sales execution. Seems like it. Plus, the core value proposition, mm -hmm. giving doctors comprehensive results with context. That integration seems to be a real differentiator. That idea of integration leads nicely into the other engine, data and services. How did that look? Also very strong. Revenue grew 26.1% year over year. And the driver there? Mostly their insights business, which is essentially data licensing to pharma and researchers. That part grew even faster, up 37.6%. And the bookings, the new contracts they signed, that was a big number, too. How big? They added another $150 million in total contract value, TCV, just in Q3. Okay, explain TCV for us quickly. Sure. TCV represents the total guaranteed dollar amount of those new multi-year data deals they signed in the quarter. It's future revenue locked in. And this $150 million is on top of a huge existing base of contracts, right? Exactly. They already had over $940 million in remaining committed TCV from deals signed previously as of the end of last year. So the pipeline is very full. That's a massive backlog. And what about keeping existing customers happy and getting them to spend more? That metric, net revenue retention or NRR, looks great too. It's around 140%. Okay, 140% NRR. What does that mean in simple terms? It means, on average, the customers who were spending, say, $1 with Tempest last year are now spending $1.40 this year. So they're not just keeping customers, they're significantly expanding the business within those existing relationships. Exactly. It's a powerful sign that customers find the data valuable and want more of it. All right. So strong execution in both core labs and data. But the long-term story, the 10-year plan, hinges heavily on AI. Let's talk about those investments. Right, the strategic moves. Like the page.ai acquisition you mentioned earlier. Digital pathology. Why buy that beyond just adding capabilities? What's the strategic fit? Well, it feeds directly into their AI ambitions, but it also solves a practical problem in the clinic today. Which is? It's something called QNS quantity not sufficient. Uh, when the biopsy sample is just too small for regular sequencing? Exactly. You get this tiny precious tissue sample, you run it for sequencing, and nothing not enough DNA or RNA. It's a huge frustration for doctors and delays treatment. So Pages Tech helps there. Their AI algorithms can analyze the digital image of the pathology slide itself. Even if sequencing fails, QNS, the AI might be able to predict key information, like say, the probability of an EGFR mutation in lung cancer, just from the image. Wow, okay, so it provides some information quickly, even when the primary tests fail. Precisely. It gives doctors something actionable faster. And all that image analysis data, it feeds back into training Tempest's bigger AI models. Speaking of which, the big one, the foundation model, they're building this massive AI model trained on their huge data set. Over 400 petabytes of de-identified oncology data. It's an incredible asset. Where are they with that project? They said it's moving from pre-training into the large-scale compute phase now. They expect the first versions perhaps in early 2026 Q1. And this is tied to that NVIDIA moment idea the CEO talks about? That's the grand vision. The belief is that eventually the healthcare system has to start paying for the intelligence, the algorithms, the data interpretation, not just the physical lab work. These dry lab CPT codes he mentioned. Right. 
He argues it's necessary for cost containment. Why pay for expensive repeat tests or ineffective treatments if an algorithm can provide better guidance up front? But getting the U.S. healthcare system to create and pay for totally new types of codes, I mean, that sounds like a monumental task, regulatory-wise, politically even. Oh, it's a massive hurdle, make no mistake. What's the biggest obstacle? Proving value. Bureaucracy. It's proving clinical utility and economic value convincingly enough to persuade payers and regulators. They need studies showing these algorithms genuinely improve outcomes and save the system money overall. Then they have to navigate the whole coding and reimbursement establishment. It's a long game. But the potential payoff is why they're making the bet. Exactly. It comes back to that scaling difference, wet lab versus dry lab. Explain that difference again because it seems central to their valuation story. Okay. Think about growing revenue in the wet lab, the yeah. physical testing part. To go from, say, $100 million to $150 million in revenue, you need more lab space, more machines, more technicians, more logistics, reagents. It's physically intensive and costly to scale. A lot of heavy lifting. Right. Now, think about the dry lab, the algorithms, the data insights. If they get regulatory approval and reimbursement for an algorithm. Like a CP2 code for an AI interpretation. Yes. The CEO's point is that distributing that algorithm, those zeros and ones, is incredibly scalable. Going from $100 million in algorithmic revenue to potentially $1 billion, theoretically, it doesn't require building vast new physical infrastructure. You flip a digital switch. Much lower marginal cost. That's the tech company scaling argument. That's the core of why they position themselves as a tech company using biology, not just a diagnostics lab. But while they wait for that NVIDIA moment, they still need to optimize the current business, the wet lab reimbursement. Absolutely. And they are pushing hard on that front. Like getting FDA clearance for their XR test as an IVD. Right. The 510K pathway. Yeah. And planning the submission for the liquid biopsy, XFF. They're also aiming for ADLT status for their main tests like XT and XF. ADLT, Advanced Diagnostic Laboratory Test. Why is that status important now? ADLT status generally allows Medicare reimbursement to be based on the test's actual list price or market rate, rather than potentially being stuck at a lower predetermined Medicare fee schedule rate. So it could mean higher payment per test? Typically, yes. It offers potential upside and helps close the gap with what more established competitors might be getting reimbursed. Right now, their average reimbursement per oncology test is around $1,600. ADLT could help push that higher. Okay, so let's wrap this up. What's the key takeaway for you, the listener, from this deep dive into Tempest AI's Q3? Well, I think it's this duality. On one hand, they hit a really important operational milestone, positive-adjusted EBITDA. They proved the core business can generate cash leverage. While still growing incredibly fast. Right. But at the same time, they're doubling down on this massive, long-term, expensive bet on AI and data, aiming for that 10-year, 25% growth trajectory. So the core challenge is managing that balancing act. Exactly. Can they keep executing flawlessly in the traditional diagnostic space, the wet lab generating the growth and cash needed? While keeping investors patient and confident as they build towards this future where the real value comes from the algorithms, the dry lab. A future that depends on the healthcare system fundamentally changing how it pays for things. That's the tightrope they're walking. And maybe that tension explains the stock dip. Strong results now, but huge ambitions and uncertainties ahead. So here's a final thought for you to consider. We saw the market react negatively, despite the solid quarter. The risk and the potential seem tied up in that gap between today's business and tomorrow's vision. Between, say, signing $150 million in data contracts now, and that CEO vision of turning $100 million in algorithmic revenue into a billion almost overnight. So, if you're evaluating a company like Tempest, a tech company playing in healthcare, where should the weight of its valuation really lie right now? Should it be grounded more in the proven physical scaling of molecular diagnostics? Or should it lean more heavily on the potential and the inherent risks of that future digitally scaled algorithmic intelligence? Which kind of scaling matters most today? 